The HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is fueled by Yukonuba. If you want to get the most of your dog in your training sessions, you need nutrition that holds nothing back. Yukonuba's new premium performance lineup is built with the nutrients dogs need to help unleash their max potential. That starts with providing energy that matches their efforts, supporting optimal nutrient delivery, and supporting post-exercise recovery. Check out the new Yukonuba Premium Performance lineup and find your dog's fuel at yukonubasportingdogs.com. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything you need to take your seven-week-old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for the free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. Sound Gear is offering a 35% discount to the HP Outdoors listeners for their instant fit industrial and shooter products. You can head over to soundgearhearing.com and use the promo code HPO35 to claim your discount today. Lifetime Decoys' new Flex Float Mallard Decoys set the new standard for quality and durability in waterfowl decoys. An EVA foam, open bottom construction combined with patent-pended dual-flow swim keel system allows for more movement and less wind, the ability to sit flat on ice and dirt, and virtually indestructible design which can be shot or otherwise punctured and still float. Each decoy weighs only 11 ounces with the self-writing keel weights removed or 19 ounces with the weights installed. Check them out today at lifetimedecoys.com. All right, welcome to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. This is episode 201. I'm your host, Josh Palm, and we are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. You can check us out at hpoutdoors.com. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you find quality podcast content, you can find our show. You can also check us out on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're a Facebook user, you can head over to our Facebook listeners group. You can chat with a bunch of like-minded hunters, get some great information, good conversation over there. And you can also run into my co-host, Dan Hrushka. Dan, what's up, brother? I am there a lot on said Facebook group. You are. You are the official, I don't know what the the position title would be, but you're... What's the gate? What's the... um, The gatekeeper? Oh, The gatekeeper at Asgard. What's his name? Like Thor's buddy. Oh, the blind guy or whatever? Is he blind? I don't think... No, but he has... He can see into all the galaxies and everything. Oh, well, that shows you what I know. And then he sticks a sword in to allow the bridge, right. the bridges to the. So you're that guy. Yeah, I'm that guy. That's cool. Well, it could be worse. <laughs> Thor was always my favorite Avenger, though. That was, he is my favorite as well. That was my guy. Yeah. Until the last one, I I started liking. I just knew new respect for Iron Man, but you know. Yeah. I don't know. He can't go against the god, though. I mean, like he's a dude, yeah. <laughs> like god of thunder. Yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, anyway, digress. Uh, this week we are talking about a topic that I think at some point in our lives we've all been there, but we basically thought let's go through some some of the most important resources out there for people that are just sort of getting into hunting because this is the kind of the time of year where guys that went out, you know, maybe with a buddy or uh, maybe tried waterfowl hunting for the first time, sometimes late in the season, you know, they're, they're kind of sitting at home right now thinking to themselves, like, I want to do more of this. I want to get into it. Like, you know, my taste of it this year was, was awesome. And and I'm hooked now and I want to get into it. So uh, there's a million things that kind of make it challenging to sort of get in. I think, for waterfowl hunting, the, the, um, what do they call that? The, the, um, what, what's the term of like getting yourself the cost of entry? That's it. The cost of entry is, is high, not only monetarily, well, it can be high monetarily, but just the amount of information that you need to sort of familiarize yourself with is a lot so your your time that you kind of invest in this is a lot so uh, a lot of different rules and regulations to understand and kind of making sure that you got all that stuff squared away so we thought 
it would be a good time to just sort of not only talk through some of the resources that we use when we were sort of starting our hunting journey, but also just ones that we've come to know over the years that are are good. So um, I don't know, Dan, what do you want to do? You want to kick it off with, with, uh, with something that you think would uh, be a good way to start this? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just start out. And since I am the gatekeeper, I will say I'll start out with the social media aspect and specifically our group, HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast Listeners Group. And for a couple of reasons, one, <clears throat> we don't allow, we don't allow questions to get smashed, which a lot of places, forums, other podcast groups, um, you definitely, if you have a new question or you know, post something up, you might get, you know, attitude or just people being negative and we don't allow that. And one of the great things about our group is that there's hunters from all over the world, literally. And usually before I even get to answer a question, there's guys on there giving a wide array of advice and it's all good. It's all different from different states or different countries and and they're on top of it so um I, I will start out by saying if you are new and looking to get into it come to our group use the search function because tons of stuff has been asked and and go from there if you don't see it ask away and and you'll get help yeah i i think um the, the nice thing about what we've done in our group is we've allowed it to be a, a place where a complete newbie can come and ask what would, you know, would get you ridiculed in many groups. You know, you can ask it there. And I, I'm to the point where I, I don't really answer many questions because most of the time, you know, people can hear what we think about stuff on, on, on this show. You know, that really that is a group uh, for the listeners to learn from listeners. Uh, in my opinion. So it's a really great collective of information. There's some super knowledgeable hunters in there, tons of experience. And as you mentioned from all over the world um, and while I'm proud of our group and it's like 9,000 strong or something like that now um, it's, you know, there's certainly other, uh, you know, groups and things that are good resources on the internet and social, you know, and, and social media, but you know, whether you're, whether your space is Reddit or uh, Facebook or Instagram or whatever, uh, it, you know, you can find good guidance on social, but you'll also find a bunch of bad, you'll find a bunch of jerks and, you know, people that are, uh, you know, not giving time of day to new people and all that kind of stuff. And you ask a question and they'll just call you like a duck dynasty wannabe or something. And, you know, that's not very productive. So that's definitely on, not what we, what we encourage yeah. in our space. <laughs> on, on top of that, um, we do have a, a roll call where you can look at people from different states. Every state province around is is marked and people that are willing to take other hunters on hunts are, you know, they have their name and and city where they're from and, and said state or province. So if you are new and looking to go out with someone and learn the ropes, like there's been a lot of people that have got together from the group and, and hunted and had good times. So yeah, come on over. Yeah. I mean, when I got started hunting, one of the most influential things from an information perspective uh, was internet forums. And, and back then it was a little different than it was today. I don't even know if these forums still exist, but the one that I spent the most time on was, was called goose hunting chat. And it was because I was primarily hunting geese to start. But, you know, there was goose hunting chat, there was duck hunting chat, there was the refuge, you know, all of them kind of had a little bit of a mixed bag, which you would find on there. But what I found when I was on the goose hunting chat forum, I would spend a lot of time looking at like the gear forums and stuff, seeing what people thought about, you know, different layout blinds and different uh, decoys and just like different tools that were used um, because I didn't have a you know a bunch of money to throw at everything so i wanted to try to learn about each individual technique or style uh and, and to see what would work for me in my scenario so uh, that was like a really just an invaluable tool uh basic stuff like that's where i learned about uh mudding and painting blinds for the first time was was 
reading a forum, I mean, you know, and it was just people talking about, you know, shine and glare and how to get rid of it and seeing people posting pictures of like just filling five gallon buckets full of mud and, you know, literally painting like their, you know, their layout blind and stuff. That was, you know, as a deer hunter reading that for the first time, I was like, you do what now? Like it was just, uh, you know, it was pretty eye opening for someone that didn't know anything about anything. So, you know, that, that information is all out there. It's super easy to consume. It's easier now than it was then. So, uh, I think most people probably are doing that, but what I would say is if you're doing that and you're not finding what you're looking for, you just keep looking because it's definitely there. Uh, there's definitely good stuff out there. If you're just, if you're not seeing what you're looking for, you just haven't got to the, quite the right spot yet. So, um, you know, take that for what it's worth and, uh, definitely leverage all that kind of stuff. Um, I think, and you made a great point about the, you know, you were looking at, goose hunting chat because primarily you were goose hunting so if you are out there and you know we talked a little bit beforehand but kind of zero in on what you expect to start hunting right you start the chase if if you're going after divers then you know don't don't spend your time and money on the on the geese you know start with the diver rig or if you're doing puddle ducks don't worry about divers so i think that's a, a great point that you were talking about previously yeah that's what we were talking about before this and really where that came to be important for me was i knew i was going to be hunting geese primarily and the challenge that i faced was i wanted you know i primarily hunted with friends or we did a couple guided hunts and stuff like that but i wanted to be able to hunt should i get access to a field i wanted to be able to go and hunt that without having to be super dependent on someone else like Hey, I get permission to hunt this feed and, you know, I'm, but I'm counting on you because you got the decoys, but you're out of town on vacation for a week or you're traveling for work or something. And now I'm just sitting here kind of screwed. So, you know, one thing that I focused on early was how can I get a reasonable spread, you know, uh, early on to put my, you know, to prevent that situation from happening without spending like a bunch of money on full body spreads and all that kind of stuff. And further at the time I was living in a two floor like condo. So I didn't have a ton of storage. So I, I, I you know, buying a, you know, six dozen full bodies was not an option for me. So I spent a lot of time reading about, you know, silhouettes and how to deploy those and how to best hunt over them and how to help use them to help conceal your blinds and all that kind of stuff that, you know, would make that particular style effective because I knew that just because of the cards that I was dealt and the hand that I was playing at the time, that was the only really options that I had. So I had to be, you know, so while I thought stuffers were cool, it made no sense for me to worry about how to make a stuffer spread at that time. Cause it was just not in the cards. Right. So it was, you know, you can, you can go, my, my point to all of this is you can go down the rabbit hole really, really far in a bunch of different directions, but I find it best to sort of narrow in on your niche is what, in, what that's going to be to start. And then you can grow from there. But, you know, the last thing you want to do is go out and buy a bunch of, uh, gear that is not suited for the type of hunting that you're going to actually be doing when you start, because Lord knows there's a lot of things that you can, and some you should, and some you probably don't need to buy, but you certainly can. There's no shortage of ways to spend your money in duck hunting or any hunting in, in general. But, you know, if you, if you know exactly what you kind of want to do, then you can start to look and find places that'll give you the information you need to, to figure out how to do it. So, um, I think that's a good point and kind of tagging on to that, you know, I learned about Roger sporting goods really early on. And, and I learned about it from that forum, you know, people are referencing it and I hadn't even heard of it before then. I'm like, what, what is that? So I went on there and for a long time, that's the only place I bought decoys from uh, because they had, you know, the good variety that I was looking for and they were affordable. They were just cheaper than everywhere else, you know, so that I could find at least at the time. So, you know, finding those little niche stores that, you know, while they sell a bunch of stuff, I've never really heard people referencing Rogers when referring to like deer hunting or deer stands or anything like that. It's always waterfowl that I've seen. That's a pretty gross generalization, obviously, but, um, you know, they, they have a lot of off, 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 awesome opportunities. And now even since that time, when I was first turned on to them, 
uh, you know, they've developed their own brand now. So, you know, you got the Rogers sporting goods brand, so you can get their decoy bags for a little bit less expensive or their waiters. Uh, if you're looking to get started in a pair of those or, you know, whatever it is. So there's a lot of different things you can do through them, but I'm sure there's other stores out there like that. That's just the one that kind of comes to mind when talking about this example. Yeah, they are the Amazon of waterfowl hunting, right? You go on there, order, and, and usually ammo. I mean, even ammo, they usually have a stuff stocked up and and ready to go. So, I mean, I know a lot of guys that buy their their year supply of shotgun ammunition from Rogers when they run their deals. You know, certain parts of the year, they just buy a pallet or whatever. You know, because they run some pretty good discounts on steel and stuff. So, I'd like to know how many how many cases they sell a year has to be astronomical i'm sure it's a lot yeah i'm actually interested to see i mean you know with the ammo we're, we're digressing here a little bit but you know with the ammo shortages that are going on right now how's that going to affect the you know this season coming up if yeah. if there's continual uh you know pressure for demand it could be uh it could be kind of dicey I I posted on my Instagram story today the, the local shelves at, at Dunham Sporting Goods are yep. completely bare, completely I, bare. I can't remember the last time I was in a store and saw a box of ammo on the shelf. It's been a minute. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So <clears throat> going to ammo and and I'll go into the next one I think, um, and that's shooting because I don't know how many new guys I've taken and. You know, just, uh, it's not deer hunting and it's not turkey hunting. You know, it's, it's a little bit different. And if you haven't shot that way before, um, you know, there's a, there's a learning curve. So, you know, a, a gentleman that we had on, who's a chief instructor, shooting instructor was Don Curry and he runs Don Curry Academy of wing and clay shooting. Um, he goes on tour pretty much on the East coast. But one thing that I found that he does do is you can take a video of yourself shooting and send it to him and he will critique your, your, you know, just your form and everything else on, on wing shooting. So I think that that, if you're really getting into it and I mean, I just, I go back to all my friends that I've taken and we'll shoot clays before opening goose and, you know, they can't, they can't hit the easy yeah. ones. And it's like, man, this is going to be a rough opener, you know, or, you know, going out for, for puddle ducks or divers. And you just know that they're going to struggle. So, you know, yeah. take, taking the time and, and energy into that just to, cause you know, every time you leave the field, man, if we would have shot better, we'd have had a limit today or, you know, oh, I mean, everyone always says it every time. Say, right. I can't tell you how many times I've said that. <laughs> so, <laughs> So Don Curry Academy of Wing and Clay Shooting. I think uh, check that out. And I'm sure that there's a ton of other instructors and, you know, even a a local club could probably help you out. Well, and this is not a resource per se, but this is sort of just the tip of the episode here, as you would call it. Um, Oftentimes, guys, you know, not only the style of shooting that you're doing when you're waterfowl hunting, but oftentimes if you've not hunted waterfowl in the past, it might be your first time working a shotgun like late season where your body's in could potentially be in like awkwardly constrained positions or you've got some bulk up top. So like really taking the time to sort of fit your shotgun, you know, a lot of people, they, they shoot their shotgun, however it comes in the box. Right. But you know, you may need to consider, you know, shimming it a little bit or, you know, adjusting the can a little bit to ensure that you can actually shoulder the gun and get your face down on the, you know, on the stock properly when you got some layers on and when you're cold and things like that. Because I know for me, that's the number one th- reason why I miss birds is I just don't get my face all the way down in the heat of the moment. And, you know, I'm just not buried down on there to make a good shot. And that, you know, that's, common when you're sitting in a blind and you're shouldering your gun for the first time and you know you're trying to do all that in the heat of the moment where you know if you're a turkey hunting you know you probably got your gun shouldered before the bird's even in sight you know you're you're a little more prepped kind of thing so it can be definitely a learning curve and there's lots of good shooting resources out there um you know to help you get get squared away on that so 
Agree. That's a good one. Uh, sort of to that end a little bit, maybe not really, I'm not sure. Um, this is kind of a, a common one, but, uh, I know it, it's what I did when I moved to the area I live in now. First thing I did was reach out to the local ducks unlimited chapter and just made, you know, made an effort to join the committee and, and served on that for several years and just made an effort to sort of meet other waterfowl hunters in the community, even though I didn't have a ton of experience at the time. Uh, you know, I wasn't going there thinking, well, these guys are just going to take me hunting now and they're going to like do everything for me. I, I literally just went there to meet like-minded people and talk about waterfowl hunting. And uh, I think the more you can immerse yourself in sort of that community and the culture of waterfowl hunting, the more you're going to learn by just simply being around those types of people. So, you know, hearing people tell stories at the meetings or, you know, uh, chatting with guys about a, a hunt that they went on over a beer and just, you know, learning kind of what the deal was. So, you know, as a new hunter for me, that was literally just looking to take in anything that I could find about, uh, waterfowl hunting, you know, the local DU local Delta chapters are fantastic. And it's a great place to get a mentor. If you, if you want one, um, if you don't have one already from like a family member or something, but ultimately I think a lot of people will tell you that that's the absolute number one best resource for you as a new waterfowl hunter is to have a mentor, someone that can show you the ropes, uh, who's experienced, you know, depending on where you live, regulations could be quite convoluted and tricky, and it's much easier to just have someone help you learn them vice trying to decipher what the, the digest says and try not to screw up and stuff. Cause that it's just, sometimes it's hard to interpret some of these things. So, you know, a real live person that can teach you, whether it's a friend, your dad, your grandpa, your uncle, whoever your you know, a Delta friend from the chapter, whatever it is, that to me is something that's so important that you should really, really try to find. And I mean, I, I mean, in this day and age, you could probably establish a pretty good mentor even, even virtually. Right. I mean, just someone that you talk to through social media regularly about things and can ask questions and bounce things off of, uh, you know, just sort of that outlet that, you know, even if you're worried about, um, posting it in a group like ours or something like that, cause you're embarrassed, like, you know, there's, you gotta have somebody to go to, to ask the questions. Right. So find that outlet, whatever it is for you so that you can get those, those questions answered. And there were, there were multiple times when I was first starting out that, you know, I'd have guys call me and be like, tomorrow's going to be good. And I'd start looking at the weather and start putting all that together. And um, the next one I'm going to go into has a little backstory too with, you know, Bad Grammar Academy with being able to go on, um, you know, go on there and learning how to call, goose calling, duck calling. And you know, you remember when we had Scott on, Scott Trinan, who's champ, 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 and, uh, <laughs> you know, just uh, a great caller that walks you through how to make all of all the sounds that you need to make to, to kill birds. But, you know, talking to him and he's like, you know, there's, there's just things that you learn that, you know, it's going to be a better hunt than if things aren't happening. One being, you know, if it's going to start snowing while you're hunting, you know, he's going that day. If it's already snowing, he might not go that day. So just little things that, you know, experience has, has showed over the years, you know, that mentor is invaluable, especially if they put birds on the ground. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing I like about what Scott's done with bad grammar and stuff is he really talks about understanding not just how to make the sound, but why the sound is made and, and how geese use it in the wild. I mean, one of the things that I picked up from bad grammar really early on was, you know, I think it's common knowledge to, and we've talked about this, but in the show on the show in the past, but it's, it, it's sort of um, reasonable thinking to say, like, if the birds are coming to you and they're working towards you, you don't need to continue to try to call to them because they're already sort of working your way. And maybe that's um, 
part of like the old turkey hunter coming out in me where it's like if the bird's working and he's liking what he's hearing like i'm not going to overdo it right i'm going to call him just enough to keep him interested keep him coming where you know scott talks about you know those birds on the ground are feeding and that is like you know literally like you talked about that's like a life and death thing for them it's like you know food shelter water is basically you know protection is they're just trying to you know scott they're uh, Sean Stahl, they're just trying to survive till tomorrow, essentially. So when they're on a feed, you know, they're they're territorial to some degree of their feed. So as birds approach the feed, uh, they're going to get louder to say like, hey, this is my feed, like back off, you know, like maintain your speed, your distance or whatever. Uh, so um, he, he gave a tip of if you've got birds landing in your field, if they're slightly out of range where you want them to, to slide up a little bit into the pocket, hammer on the call, right? Like right before their feet touch the ground, hammer the call. And I remember we did this on an opening day hunt up in PA a couple of years back where they were landing just on the fringe of the range and their feet were almost touching the ground. And we hammered the call and they literally picked up and slid like another six, seven, eight yards, like up into the pocket, giving us that much closer of a shot. Uh, and I, I mean, from that time, I was like, dang on, man, that was like, like, it was like you wrote the, like they, you know, like they read the story, they knew the script, <laughs> yeah. right. That was what was supposed to happen. So since that time, it, I was, a, you know, I'm a believer. So I think he that knows what he's talking too. about. That yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he, he, I think he knows a lot about what he's, you know, what he's talking about with this stuff because he spent a lot of time sort of, you know, in the field and studying that stuff. So, um, you know, those are great resources that are out there and that that's an old resource, man. Bad grammar has been around for a long time, you know, so it's not something, I mean, that thing's, I don't even know how old it is, but it's been a while and it's still as good today as it was, you know, back, back when it came out. So it definitely, it definitely holds up. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, great learning. And, and, you know, there is a Facebook group for that as well, that it's not, it's not super active, but there are people in there willing to help out. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would say also, on that note, uh, I mean, today, you know, over the last five years, I'd say, how long have we been doing this show? Like, when do we start Six doing this? and a half. Yeah. 16. Okay. Wow. Sheesh. So when we started this show, there was not a lot of waterfowl podcasts out. Um, I mean, Kelly belts had done one for a long time that kind of like stuttered out, you know, he'd kind of stopped doing. And then uh, um, Max did like eight or nine episodes and there may have been a couple other fringe ones, but at the time podcasts were just kind of getting going and really the big game Western sort of format uh, was sort of leading the charge, right? They were then sort of the first big market to be covered. So really podcasts weren't a great resource at that time for information, but now podcasts are so common, you know, everything is covered on podcasts uh, to include, you know, waterfowl hunting, you know, so there, there's a lots of options out there, not just ours that, you know, they can be a great resource. So podcasts, YouTube, uh, you know, there's a lot of content being created out there for people to like expedite that learning curve and just help you become more knowledgeable. And, and really it just kind of, it's one of those things where it's like, you can have a really good time and be a really successful hunter with, uh, for everyone that can't see it, I'm air quoting here, a high school degree in waterfowl hunting. But if you want to be a PhD and you want to study this stuff and like, you know, make it your life's passion, there's infinite opportunities to learn just on the internet, you know, podcasts, YouTube, all that stuff. It's endless out there. So, you know, it's all about what you want to get out of it because there's certainly a lot to be had. And, um, you know, for me, that kind of goes in waves. When I first started, it was like obsessive. All I would do is just read waterfowl content and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it ebbs and flows over the years. I go on these kicks where I'll binge for a while and then I'll, you know, I'll move on and read about deer hunting and other stuff. You know, so it's like, I kind of, kind of flop back and forth, but you know, over the years I've learned uh, probably way more from people on the internet, you know, the, 
the bad grammars of the world and just those kinds of resources out there. I've probably learned more from those people. Um, actually, I'm going to say two things. I've learned the most that I've learned from in my hunting <laughs> career, whatever that's worth, um, is on the internet, no doubt. And then hunting with guides. That's where I learned the most uh, every time. You know, it's like, if you've never hunted with a guide, the first time you hunt with a guide may be the first time you hear somebody that can really blow a goose call as an example. And I, can, I know when we would hunt up on the Eastern Shore every year, I left that hunt each time feeling like a better call, just have having just from having heard that person, you know, Casey, our boy calling on his call, I felt like made me feel like a better caller because I would go home and I would mimic those sounds and that cadence and just try to mimic what I heard. And I felt more confident and I felt like it helped me develop a lot better. So, um, you know, those are things that, again, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, hunting with outfitters in the beginning because, they're a great resource to learn from and there's a lot of good ones out there you know so you find the right fit and and that's i think it's money well spent when you're kind of getting going that's even you know going back to those days to this year you know going out to kansas when i'm in the blind i'm asking questions like the entire time i probably annoy guides and it's not it's not that i'm trying to change guides, anything but, okay <laughs> it's, i'm not i'm not trying to you know question what they're doing and i hope it doesn't come across as that but it's just you know hunting different areas compared to what we do and it's like so why why did you do that why are we you know why are we set up this way instead of this way and and they they got a, a, a good reason for it and it works so well and i can tell you to like your point i've heard you talk about this with with the guys when we're out in kansas and stuff if you want to learn body um i'm not sure what the word here is but like just behavior from waterfowl spend time around a guide who is scouting them every day and is paying attention to weather and paying attention to moon phase and all these things that impact movement and you know you'll be in a blind and there'll be birds out and you're like you know dan will drop a six pack out front or whatever and they're like yeah that's not our birds like they just, you know what I mean? They can just tell by the direction they're flying from or the way that they're uh, approaching our, our hide and our setup, like which ones potentially will work or not. And it's, you know, it's my nature. I only see, you know, eight birds a hunt in the Atlantic flyway. So I want to work every one that I see where they're, they have the ability to just identify, okay, these ones are the ones we want to work. And, you know, more times than not, you, you, those ones at least, come in and work the spread they don't always land right but you know those you know there's birds that fly by and don't give you a second look and you're like what is the deal like <laughs> what, what's going on here right yeah and they're like they're like yeah 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 and then there's other birds that come in and, and they're like all right these ones are ours and it's like okay i don't know why you know but i'm glad someone yep. does yep. you know kind of thing but well, how many times i'll be like i'll be like there's you know four on the deck coming straight in and they'll be like nope you know six pack yeah. to the right <laughs> going straight down the line is like all right. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, they definitely know. So yep. uh, a great point. And we've, we've said that from day one, you know, go with a guide and just see if it's what you want to do to really start investing all that time and energy and, and money. So, but chances are if, if you're, if you went once and you liked it and then you go with a guide, it's, it's just gonna throw, throw a gas on the flame there. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you know, sometimes depending on where you're, you're hunting and you have access to, you know, if your option is to hunt with a guide on a regular basis or join a hunt club, it might be just as cost effective or, or better or more so to hunt with a guide, you know, two or three Saturdays a month, or, you know, if you can work out a deal like that or something like that. So, you know, it's definitely a good option, you know, for certain, for certain situations, but, um, I'm going to shift gears off of that a little bit, Dan, because there's, there's one tool that I used an absolute ton. I still, still use it to this day, but not as much as I did when I was first getting started. And I would tell, and I've said this on the show before, but I would tell every single new hunter that you should have the LeMaster method of waterfowl identification book in your possession. Mm. It's $11, $11 and four cents on Amazon right now. I just looked it up comes in a little spiral bound book it's waterproof pages 
and it'll help you with duck identification, not only just once you've harvested a bird, um, but also it'll talk to you about the different types of birds and um, their wing beat pattern. And do they fly high or do they typically fly low? And, you know, what color are their underwings? So if they're flying over top of you, what colors would you expect to see? Uh, just things that are going to help you identify birds in flight, because that is a really, really challenging thing for a new hunter to do. Uh, it's challenging for some experienced hunters. I mean, you know, like, I think it's really hard to do. I mean, some people are really, really good at it. Um, maybe I'm not as good as, as most, but I, you know, I think it's challenging, you know, and for the most part, I can get pretty close, but like sometimes, you know, it's just, it's hard. Uh, so that's a really good, uh, tool and resource to have. It's caught, it's not expensive at all. And, you know, I just think it's an absolute has have to must have, I think every, you know, dad or whoever should buy it for a, a new hunter, a new kid. Um, I just think it's a really, really important, a really, really important tool. So if you've not heard of it, check it out. You can get it on Amazon, super cheap. And I, mine still goes in my blind bag with me every single hunt, just in the event. I want to reference it for some reason. Does that speak about um, how rapid the, the wing beat is? I think so. I thought so too. And yeah. that's a, that's one of the biggest things, especially, and, and you think about it, you know, you're talking right at, you know, 30 minutes be before sunrise and it's dark, like being able to tell right. between a black duck and a mallard. Yep. And some people are going to tell you, they can definitely tell, I tell you what, I have pretty good eyes and, and it is, it is difficult. Even, you know, we're, we're shooting two mallards and one hen. I mean, it's, it's tough to tell between drakes and hens, depending on time of year, especially yep. at first light. So um, that is, a, that is a, a great resource and I have one of those. It's not in my blind bag, but definitely spend a lot of time looking over that. Um, I want to move on and, and this is going back to, you know, hunting on the Eastern shore and watching gun dogs and dogs that do what you want them to do on hunts and, you know, a resource that we obviously talk a, a lot about is Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. And even, you know, for newbie trainers, like if you, if you're just getting a pup and want to go through a, a 52 week program, like they have that and it's an app now, so you can have your phone out for drills and, and everything else. So it's, it's just a great resource overall. And their Facebook group. If you have any questions, there are multiple trainers in there that are more than willing to help. And they do have a, a podcast now that just talks to guys going through it and, and, you know, issues they're having and, and accomplishments and, and everything else. So there's nothing better than hunting over a good gun dog. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, if you're at the point where you're looking to train a dog, it's a great resource for sure. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I don't have a dog. I don't have a gun dog. My dog is actually um, not doing so hot. He's, he's uh, kind of on his last, uh, you know, journey in life here. He's got pretty advanced cancer, so he's doesn't have much longer with us. So he's not going to be doing any hunting, but um, you know, if you've got a dog, you know, a pup or, a, you know, a dog that you, you know, still would like to get some training with, you know, it's a great resource, you know, it's not just for puppies and stuff like that. So, um, you know, definitely you can look into that. Uh, I got one more thing or area. And then again, this is not like new stuff, but this is something that as we've gone on through time here and, um, you know, technology has advanced uh you know the what we use our phone for has become more and more and you know waterfowl hunting is no different uh you know on x base map those types of programs to, to find out private landowner information to engage those folks in conversation um about getting permission is huge if you've never uh listened to our our episode on gaining permission on private ground i would definitely check that out i personally think that's one of our best episodes we've ever had I think that's a really a really good one that I've I've seen just a ton of people give feedback on that, that they like some of the the tips that we give there. Uh, and I would also say 
you know, find a weather app that you really are confident in for your area, you know, so that you can keep your eye on that extended forecast. You know, when cold fronts are going to be coming through, you can, you know, know wind direction, uh, you know, temperature change, uh, sunrise, sunset uh, tables, moon phase information, all that kind of stuff can be found easily on free apps. Uh, my, my weather app of choice is weather underground. It seems to be, um, pretty accurate for my area and it just has a ton of uh, information. So I've settled on that one, but your mileage obviously may vary, I guess. So uh, yeah, I mean, being able to leverage that tech it's uh, is another important thing. I think for newbies that, you know, especially if you're a younger hunter, that's, you know, you're doing a lot with your phone anyway, you should be, you know, more than capable of, of leveraging it. Make sure you, you know, you do that. Yeah. I'm still stuck on AccuWeather. That seems to be pretty good. And then a new one that I use quite often is is actually um, UAV forecast since I'm flying drones all the time now. Yeah. And definitely, you know, the wind direction and wind speed is uh, pretty legit you, on there. So you just want to know what the wind speed is at like 400 feet AGL so that, you know, yeah. <laughs> make sure you can handle it. <laughs> make sure I'm good to go. Yeah. So. so it's uh but it's usually spot on and uh and i i do enjoy that so yeah well and a lot of these these apps now um i use both on x and base map I, I can't recall half the time what which one has a specific feature that the other one doesn't uh but one of them maybe both of them i can't remember has the wind direction indicator so if you put a pin and you want to hunt there it'll show wind forecast for 24 hours uh, into the future. So it'll just show you like, like this smoke, you know, blowing, you know, envision like a powder bottle or something when you're deer hunting, it kind of shows you where the wind's going to be blowing. So if you're hunting a particular field or know where they're coming from roost to feed, or there's like topography challenges in the field you want to try to leverage or a hide you want to try to leverage or you know you'll be able to say hey the sun's going to rise over here the wind's going to be blowing here so maybe that'll help uh, dictate your setup in the morning all that kind of stuff just helps you to be a little more prepared uh, and it's just super easy to you so it's kind of just silly to not take advantage of that and just sort of use it as a piece to uh to the puzzle or to solve the puzzle i guess so yeah apps no, apps in no. that Apps in that tools in the toolbox, mm -hmm. good stuff. I mean, and that's, you know, it's, like you said, this, uh, we get tons of questions like this in the group and, and emails asking. And like you said, we're, we're trying to, to bridge the gap between what we know and, and new hunters. So any other questions like this or about this episode, you know, reach out to us and, and we'll try and help out any way we can. Yeah. And the other thing I would just say about this whole topic in general is I think it's really good to have sort of, so I shouldn't say it's really good, but I think most really successful hunters, whether you're talking waterfowl, deer, turkey, whatever, most really successful hunters have a continuous learning mindset where they're always consuming new information and they're always thinking about how things are evolving and how things change because while yes, you can deploy the same tactics over and over again. Um, you know, there's a lot of other people that have been doing those same tactics for a long time. So if you're able to adopt and, 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 uh, you know, flex to these new techniques and these new approaches that folks are trying to, you know, that you read about, you know, help, it'll help you be at least on the, the forefront of what's out there in, you know, you know, trying different things. So, uh, I think, the idea that you ever have it completely figured out is not a good one. And it's just not real. Um, you know, there's always stuff to be learned and always, you know, things to improve on or learn from. And obviously the number one way to learn is actually get out there and hunt and see birds and, and experience that interaction and learn from that. So, uh, you know, the other thing I would say for my final resource is just manage your time the best you can. You know, uh, if you only get to hunt a handful of days a year, try to hunt the best days of the year, you know, find days that are, you know, keep your eyes on the weather apps and stuff and look for migration days and try to try to hunt those days. I mean, depend on your flyway, 
you might only get a couple good pushes a year. And if you miss those, you're kind of probably stuck trying to hunt stale birds and just kind of scavenge what's around. So um, those, those, those push days are those magical days. And if you can get a good feel for when those are going to happen and um, that kind of stuff, you're just going to be all the better for it. So that's all I, I got. Honest, I think honestly, like <clears throat> the springtime, like right now getting out and if you have a camera or, you know, just enjoy spending time outside, go out and watch the birds. Now they haven't been hunted. Well, depending where you're at, but you know, duck season's out everywhere, you know, go and see what they're doing now, see how they're acting and not pressured and what, what a setup should look like, you know, and, and envision that and kind of keep that in the back of your mind by the time fall comes around and how, how things should look and, you know, how, how you should portray your setups. Yeah. I mean, you got to match, match what's going on out there if you want to be as realistic as possible. So no better way to learn than, than to watch the real thing. So you got any other uh, resources or anything you want to throw at them before we wrap it? I think it's pretty good. Um, I think we covered a lot and, um, you know, I just going back to when we were new and you get too much thrown at you at once, it's, it might be overwhelming. So that's a good place to start and, you know, start looking at those resources and, and confirming what you want to get into. And if you're listening to this and there's another resource out there that you know of that you like, and we didn't mention it, you know, hit us up on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, let us know and make sure we pass that along. Um, we're not the best at staying up to date on the emails, if I'm being honest with you. So social media gets answered a lot more than emails do typically uh, for the most part. So that's the best way to reach us. Uh, all right, Dan, you got, you got anything else? One last thing before we close out? No, it was still snowing here today. So I'm just waiting for a little bit warmer weather and mm, uh, be 70 degrees here this week. I think we're supposed to hit 60, but I'll probably get one more, uh, one more shred the gnar session tomorrow, Ooh, nice. this Sunday. So at least one more before uh, season's out there on the, on the slope. So been a, been a good year. Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time on the, on the slopes for sure on the mountain mountain all right let's get out of here um yeah that's gonna do it for this episode of the hp outdoors waterfowl podcast if you're new to the show head over to itunes check out some of our past episodes and while you're there leave us a five-star rating and review it's the best way for like-minded hunters just like you to find our show Check us out on social media. Check us out over at hpoutdoors.com and anywhere you can find quality podcast content. That's going to do it for this week. Till next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. <laughs>